An educator, hail from the state of um, New Jersey, <laughs> and um, so what I'm going to be focusing on today is um, basically a paper that I wrote that dealt with not just art history and social history, but also how it's connected to the artistic process and specifically my artistic process. And so I'll just kind of like go through because um, I know we all have, we have time limit here. I'll just kind of like go through those main points and kind of like bring some of those intersections together in my own work. And so the title is Seeing Red, um, an artist's look at housing discrimination in America. Um, so one of the first things I want to talk about is the idea of redlining. Um, my work usually focuses on visual repetition, and particularly visual repetition to illuminate certain instances of institutionalized discrimination in America. And so one of the artists that has always um, really stood out to me was this man by the name of Saidu Kaisha, who is a Malian artist. And a lot of his work deals with these intersections. Um, usually what he has been doing you know, in his work, or what he did in his work around the 1960s, the turn of the 1970s, was kind of creating a juxtaposition between technology and traditionalist culture. And so if you were to look at the image on the screen, you'd see him photographing a Malian man who has kind of like that traditional garb of his country juxtaposed with the radio at the same time. So that tension between technology and tradition is you know, something even big today when we think about how technology can even replace certain traditions or how technology can displace us from certain traditions. But what we see in this image is he's trying to put it together. And so when I was thinking about my own work, I wanted to deal with that idea of visual repetition and the juxtaposition. And so he was one of the first artists I thought about when I was actually starting my project on housing discrimination. And you'll kind of see how it comes together in the end. The next artist I was inspired by before I began my project was someone you know, Romare Baradin, um, and his Harlem series. And a lot of his collages kind of dealt with that structural identity of black America. Of course, Harlem now is more gentrified, but during that time, um, a lot of the energy in Harlem was represented through his collages, whether it was the barber shop in the um, collages, you could actually see um, some of the, the stores that the, um, a lot of African Americans went to during those times, the church, which was a staple of African American life um, during that time, and you could kind of like see how he was putting on the structure of black identity so that the audience can see it. Um, and just in the real, and that was kind of like a very interesting idea because I wanted to deal with structures, structural discrimination, but I wanted to talk about structures in my own work and how those were presented to the public. And so, um, Said Al Kaisha, and of course, Romare Bearden. So taking these two, I was considering how can I use some of the artists and use that social history and use that art histor historical knowledge to inform my own work? And so one of the first things I found um, online it was um, a pro basically a program that was put together by the University of Richmond and Virginia Tech. 
and they basically took the old maps, the old redlining maps from the 1930s, and were able to map out the entire United States and archive that information of what they actually looked like. And it's on the far right um, for Essex County, which is the county that I live in. And so redlining was, um, so, uh, probably a lot of people here know, but redlining was the system of disinvestment from black neighborhoods using discriminatory housing policy in the 1930s. It, of course, it, it went, technically, of course, as everything is, it was done away with with the Civil Rights Act of 1964, but the generational effects continue to this day. Um, I literally live Uh, so that was one of the redlined um, areas in the 1930s. It was Orange, New Jersey, and it's what, and it's still to this day one of the lowest socioeconomic areas in the state of New Jersey. And interestingly enough, two blocks away, I could throw a rock and get a house. Two blocks away is South Orange, New Jersey, which is one of the highest income neighborhoods in the state of New Jersey. So we always think about that idea of you know income inequality existing a train track away or a block away, right? And it's funny because there's a train track right behind my house. And guess what's on the other side of that train track? South Orange, New Jersey. And so just kind of like considering this idea of the proximity and juxtaposition was something that was very important in my own project. And in the middle there is the train station that separates the line that divides. And on the very far left side is actually the original document for the housing, um, the Federal Housing Administration creating that red line district in Orange, New Jersey. And it literally specified that 40% of this neighborhood was specifically African American. Or, you know, and then the other 30% were immigrants. And so the entire thing wasn't able to be printed for some reason. If you were to go on to like the redlining map, you wouldn't be able to print the entire thing. But you, I was able to kind of like take a snapshot of a portion of it. And it kind of like detailed the redlined areas in Essex County at that time. Oops. And so, uh, got cut off there. But um, for this part, what I started to do was I wanted to examine my own neighborhood. So it was Orange, New Jersey, and this was of course, um, um, like I said before, one of the areas that were redlined in uh, my community. And I wanted to be able to see what that meant. And so one of the things that um, I noticed and it's actually really interesting how just skin color can determine value. But um, one of the largest gaps that I saw in housing quality and investment was found on this street. I want to make sure I have the street right. But it was North 17th Street in East Orange, New Jersey. And the funny thing is, in Newark, which is also one of the original redlined areas, and a, um, a lot of parts of it are in poorer, lower socioeconomic areas, the poorest areas are the numbers. So either like North 56th, or whether, for some reason, for whether it's in Orange, New Jersey, or even in Newark, New Jersey, the lo low income areas always have the numbers attached to them. And so it's kind of interesting how it, the, the process behind that. And so one of the largest gaps in housing quality investment was found on this street, North 17th Street in East Orange, New Jersey. One side of this street were in good, um, one, of course, the houses, you know, basically on this street were boarded up. Usually the average home value was under 100,000, around 50 to 70,000 in this area. And the median home value in the whole state of New Jersey is 312,000, right? And so you could already see that disparity. And the median home value between Orange, New Jersey and South Orange, New Jersey is literally three, threefold. It's the same thing in Orange, New Jersey. For the houses in Orange, New Jersey, it'd be around 50 to 70, and the homes in South Orange are actually even higher than the median. They're in 500,000 range, 500,000 to 700,000 range. And so one of the things I was considering during this time was a juxtaposition, um, juxtaposition not only of house value, but on black life. Um, and so the idea of putting a price on the person of color that lives in the neighborhood, what is that person worth to the investors that might not want to invest there? Or what is that person worth to that community that makes certain home prices go down when a certain type of, or a group of people go to that neighborhood or in that um, township. When 
of the things I originally wanted to do was sketch out my idea. Um, it's a part of the process that I wanted to focus on, and this is where kind of like the inspiration from Romare Baradin came along, because I didn't want to deal with structure. Romare Baradin was mainly trying to illuminate black life through his collages, and so the structural part of his work was very important to him, and so I wanted to deal with that structure like Romare Baradin but just in a different way, talking about housing policy and housing discrimination. And so I basically kind of sketched out just a quick sketch of some rough ideas of what I had in mind for maybe kind of creating that idea of not just repetition, but also juxtaposition between homes that are in low value neighborhoods that have been affected by housing policies and maybe some that are in areas that haven't been. And it's also interesting um, when I spoke about structure that it also affects um, the prevalence of food deserts. Um, a lot of times we think of food deserts as uh, the place doesn't have a supermarket, but I have a supermarket in my community, but it's still a food desert. It still is a low income community. The issue is they get the secondhand stuff. They get the secondhand goods. Um, a lot of times, uh, what ends up happening is like the big stores, whether it's the Whole Foods or Targets, usually request the best quality of food, and then like the stores, like for instance, the store that I live next to called Bravo, usually gets kind of like whatever the big stores don't want. Um, a lot of times, I could have sworn like last week I saw, I went to Bravo and I saw like mold on bread on the shelf. So it just signified how prevalent the issue was with food disparity between low-income neighborhoods and high-income neighborhoods. And it goes all the way back to policies that disallow investment into certain communities where people of color live. And so that's when I started to document the inequality. And so I used collages. So first I um, thought of the idea of repetition. And, uh, and a lot of um, suburbia in the houses that haven't been affected by redlining. You know, we, we think, you know, we have that idea of suburbia with the houses, you know, in a neat little row, they all kind of like look the same because the housing administration doesn't want to rock the boat too much, can't go flashy with your colors. It's kind of like that uniform visual repetition and juxtaposed against some of the houses in the background that are part of the redlined neighborhoods. They may have, you know, be boarded up. They probably have a pawn shop in the neighborhood probably a liquor store, which is you know, all elements of my neighborhood. These are images that I took, and I just cut up into collages. And so I was trying to deal with that idea of juxtaposition. So the collage forms, using um, the collage forms, and taking that collage um, reference from Romare Bearden and some of the issue from the structures that he was trying to push, in addition to the juxtaposition with um, Said Al-Kaisha, I just wanted to combine those to kind of like give a reference for what housing discrimination would actually look like in the real. And it's usually that close together. The proximity is what um, really interests me with collage because I can literally put it right together because these places are a train drive away. They are two, maybe even one block away. And it's just so interesting how the, the, um, the income disparities can exist in such close proximity to each other. Here are a couple of them. So this was a series of 60 that I did. Um, some of this, uh, so I, I spaced it out because one of the things I like to do is um, show and educate in different spaces. And so I presented um, some of these in high schools um, at, at, in, in previous places where I taught in Newark, New Jersey. Um, some of the, um, the cars are in Seton Hall University on exhibition and some are in Everhart Museum. And so in different um, spaces, I usually try to show different types of works. And not only just different types of works, but I usually accompany them with the redlining maps for those states. And if you could see like in the upper right hand corner, um, that was actually um, part of my neighborhood in Orange, New Jersey, and right on the, for the one in the upper right hand corner to the left of it, there's a pawn shop, which are very prevalent in lower socioeconomic areas. This work is, um, per, is uh, um, on view at Valley, um, Valley Arts Community Gallery, right in Orange, New Jersey. And I was able to give an artist talk to the people who actually go through you know, that system of redlining. And one of the things I wanted to do, and the reason why I actually went sculptural with um, the work was because I wanted to focus on the idea of 
the structure uh, in, in two different types of ways. 2D also explains the proximity, but also I was able to put it together and kind of like give the sense of structure to that discrimination or to that housing policy. And so basically this is still the collage, but on the back there's wood backing uh, on the back of it that's pasted, um, that's pasted together. Um, one more thing, when I was um, actually considering the project on, um, on documenting inequality, one of the other things I was also thinking about was how I could show not just one area of that inequality in a neighborhood, but multiple views of it. Because um, one of the things that I found, um, like I was saying before, is that housing discrimination doesn't just mean wealth. It doesn't just talk about certain wealth in a neighborhood. Or it doesn't just mean that, oh, the, the houses are boarded up, so they look in a certain way. And so that's, that's an example of housing discrimination. But it could literally go, like I was talking um, about before, to our food system. It could literally go to you know, our water system, as we've seen in Flint. And so all these facets of housing discrimination are part and parcel of the existence of black life and the value of black life that America puts on our society. And these are just some close-ups. Um, one of the things that I wanted to do, especially in the left-hand corner, was show that visual repetition from not just the front, but also from the sides, to be able to see how privilege can reproduce itself in suburbia, but also how discriminatory housing poly policy can reproduce itself. And so both the foreground and the background are in um, terms of reprodu uh, reproduction. Thank you. for her centenary, which was in 2013, February 4th, 2013. She uh, was her centenary. She would have been 100 years old. So Rosa Parks was a seamstress. Her temperate beauty and sartorial restraint fit the American Civil Rights Movement like a made-to-measure gown. For this reason, Ms. Parks has remained for more than 60 years an enduring symbol of the civil rights era. Because as most people know, most people who have some awareness of civil rights history know that she was not the first person to be tired on a bus. Sewing as diligently by day as she soldiered for civil rights by night, volunteering for the NAACP. Uh, Ms. Parks famously refused in December 1955 to yield her seat to a white man in the black section 
of a public bus in Montgomery, Alabama. It was the white section was full, someone came back and wanted to sit in the black section, which was not the right of black people, even though it was called the black section. And that is actually where she was sitting. In so doing, she disobeyed the strict segregation laws of the Jim Crow South. Her act launched a more than one year long bus boycott and led a, to a hard fought victory in the United States Supreme Court. Glad it's not today. This is so relevant, more relevant than I realized when I was writing this. It, you know, this sounds like a victory speech, but it's not. It's, it's actually to keep us aware of where we really are right now. Under Browder v. Gale, decided in December 1956, public transportation companies could no longer legally enforce racial segregation. The decision marked the end of a kind of human herding crudely cut from the same cloth as segregated schools outlawed in 1954 and slavery. Ms. Park celebrated the moment with a new bus ride and hopeful patterned day dress. So that photo on your left is not before. It's an after photo. It's a staged photo. Icons of nonviolence live peacefully and too often die violently young and in public. Fortunate to be 92 years old when she died in 2005, Ms. Parks could personally recount the story of a movement's good idea and her big action. The most memorable images of Rosa Parks nevertheless remain frozen in a scant selection of black and white photographs taken in 1955 and 1956. These images with Ms. Parks as their central subject accurately depict the gravitas of her quest, our quest. The photos show important corollary civil rights players that almo who almost always go unmentioned, and I should say that almost always go unmentioned, the clothing and robing Miss Parks and the public spaces exposing her. Symbolically, they battle for and against her as she does her part to cure America of its genetic defect of enduring prejudice. The first, or pre-victory, images show Ms. Parks being booked and fingerprinted at the Montgomery Police Station. So that's this one on the right. Dressed in her protest best, she dons a small, dark velvet hat with twisted cord trim and a somber fit and flare jacket with no-nonsense natural striping. And I should also say, and I'm I may continue to say it, that it's not only her protest best, but it's her Sunday best. And those were often one and the same. One can imagine but not see sensible shoes. Contemporaneous images on the courthouse steps reveal a matching skirt, a medium colored oversized classic 1950 swing coat with a gently sloping shawl collar and a small dark pocketbook. Once the preferred Southern word for a handbag. Ms. Parks wears incomplex but serious wire eyeglasses. Their purpose, it seems, is to help her see clearly and nothing more. Although she had married Raymond Parks, a barber, more than 20 years earlier, no wedding ring is in sight. Ms. Parks' manner of dress accentuates the nature of her action, dignity without fandangle, Lest the view conclude, viewer conclude that clothing doesn't matter, if Miss Parks had dressed in a Saturday night tight dress, bright pumps, a little jacket, and sparkly lipstick with cascading hair, she may have been lovely, but a decidedly worrisome, i.e. sexy, symbol. She adroitly left her physicality to the imagination as if she already filled a sacred role. The officialdom of Ms. Park's surroundings at the police station, sh station seems at once a backhanded compliment. This is serious business. And another absurd example of the criminalization of self-determination. In the booking photo, she holds up the one in the middle. She holds up her number, 7053, virtually expressionless, 
She stares steadily into the camera with neither shame nor pride. She shares the space of the fingerprinting photo with an officer. He looks younger than Ms. Parks' 42 years. His hair is perfectly calm and shiny with a careful side part. His white shirt and dark tie are formal and clearly the law is on his side. His wedding ring is visible, bringing his wife into the picture. What will he say to her that evening? Miss Parks has had a long day and her hair shows wear. She is framed by the open door, the way out, but she will have to spend the night. How long will it take to scrub from her finger pads the indignity of Jim Crow ink? The second image of Ms. Parks taken soon after the Supreme Court victory, the one I mentioned on the left, shows her sitting close to the front of a public bus. She wears a dark and formal pillbox hat and a patterned shirt waist day dress of the era. She also wears what appears to be the same coat and purse from a year earlier. It is unsurprising that tight finances led, likely prevented inessential shopping during that austere time. Both Ms. Parks and her husband had lost their jobs. In the photo, she holds tightly to the purse, barely visible behind the metal arm of the seat in front of her. Other photos have shown Ms. Parks wearing sturdy and dark laced shoes with thick two inch heels. They also depict her cheerfully boarding the bus with fellow black travelers. While this outfit suffers no fools, the allowance of a pattern in the dress signifies a hint of joy. It seems more personal than the arrest outfit. During this post-victory ride, the space of the bus is now displayed as an inclusive one, however reluctantly. The presence of the press signifies that the shift is monumental. A reporter sits behind Ms. Parks while obviously a photographer memorializes the moment. She looks somewhat confined by the journalist in combination with the severe geometry of the metal seats with shiny hardware, the tall and rectangular windows, and hard, curved bus ceiling. Is everything really going to be okay? Ms. Parks gazes directly, di gaze directs the viewer out of the window and into the world, the bigger picture. Perhaps similarly to the day of her arrest, only she looks beyond the bus. She may be observing the familiar flawed streets of her hometown or contemplating the future. In a short time, it will lead her to Detroit. Hard times preceded this fruitful day. Arguably harder times in the struggle for civil rights will follow it. There can be no doubt that the map of Ms. Parks' life changed. She must be profoundly satisfied and relieved that her personal risk paid off for thousands. This victory lap must be sweet, bittersweet too. Ms. Parks had been fired days before Christmas 1955 from her position at Montgomery Fair Department Store. Once the city's anchor store, it is now a cluster of rental apartments marketed disturbingly using Ms. Parks' name. It has also been reported that she and her husband suffered from ulcers and other stress-related health problems for several years. On the day of her arrest, Ms. Parks was crafting a new dress for herself. Photographs of the piece now housed at the Smithsonian Institution show a lightweight mid-calf garment with long sleeves. It crosses over at the waist and self belts. The dress is covered with golden and gray leaves on a white background. Leaves often reveal the season. In 1955, it was a season of change. Rosa Parks, between stitches on her new dress, helped construct a stronger, sturdier piece of the ensemble of American history. She remains a powerful reminder as we enter another season of protest. We've already entered it, we're in it that a woman cloaked in courage may be cast out of fashion, but she never goes out of style.
Thank you. Um, I first want to begin by acknowledging the indigenous land on which I'm a guest, the Abenaki and the Penacook people who live in, in New Hampshire, and to acknowledge also my ancestors. So <clears throat> this paper is born from a long, a long time of thinking through race and representation in a question that I've been kind of sitting with lately that I think will really frame this is um, thinking today if Emmett Till were to die in 2018, would his mother choose to have an open casket in a moment in which um, we are bombarded with pictures and videos of black people dead and dying, would she choose to have an open casket at a funeral? Okay, so black feminist theories of flesh, embodiment, biopolitics, visual culture, emerges from my preoccupation with discourses in black studies and the history of art on the relationship of embodiment to visual representation. Understanding the abject conditions of black life as both corporeal and philosophical in nature, I am interested in how violence to the body works for and with Eurocentric masculinist processes of narrativizing black womanhood. I am intrigued by the possibility of the body as a tool for intervention and resistance despite the violence it has endured under global forms of domination. While both adhering to and troubling art historical binaristic model of realism and abstraction, I engage the embodied interventions of black women's realist self-portraits as well as abstraction of the female form and collage. I operate primarily on Hortense Spiller's conceptualization of the flesh in uh, Foucault's definition of biopolitics, um, but I turn to other related theories such as necropolitics, social death, and bare life. Um, so these are various theorists with whom Spiller's is in dialogue, and the difference between the body and the flesh is marked by the distinction between people living in captivity versus those who are in liberated subject positions. So the flesh is the materiality of the body without sovereignty. Flesh precedes embodiment. It is a human form that is divested of its own authority. And then biopolitics, the technology of biopower, describes the processes of how human life is valued differently based on levels of conformity to normative citizenship. Biopolitical discourses coordinate with anatomal politics to form the context in which Foucault is writing. Anatomal politics is the disciplining of individual bodies in the modern state in order to purportedly maintain the general welfare of the population. Um, Sidia Hartman's Venus in Two Acts influences my conceptualization of what it means to engage with the unspeakable and irreparable violence in the archive of racial slavery. And Christina Sharp's monstrous intimacies guides my analysis of what it means to be positioned as a racialized looker. And then lastly, I use um, Wahelier's book, Habeas Viscous, um, in which he outlines Agamben's bare life, Foucault's biopolitics, Patterson's social death, and Mbembe's necropolitics as theoretical frameworks that exist in the same arena as the flesh. And Wahelier criticizes Agamben and Patterson for their privileging of social context above the corporeality of the homo soccer figure. And the homo soccer figure is the subject that's deprived of all rights to self-possession and, as Mbembe notes, is ultimately killable. And Spillers and Wahelier's expansions on these frameworks note a possibility for an analysis of racialized minority populations that attends to the materiality of their embodied experiences. Um, in addition, Wahelier interrogates bare life and biopolitics discourses for not positioning race as a central tenet in his examples of approaches to how hierarchies of human difference are theorized and mapped onto subaltern populations. And I also use Aliyah Abdurrahman's Black Grotesquerie to think about abstraction as a possibility to theorize black life outside of normative and realist constraints.
<coughs> Renee Cox is a Jamaican American contemporary artist. This is a self portrait in which she embodies the hot and top Venus archetype using prosthetic fleshiness on her bottom and breast. Sarchi Bartman, an indigenous South African woman, was enslaved and brought to Europe to be placed on display for white audiences. Her genitalia, referred to as the hot and taut apron, was dissected by father of paleontology George Cuvier in order to further articulate a scientific theory of black women's hypersexuality as linked to their fleshy genitalia. Cox returns to this image in a moment in which black women are still under state surveillance and popularly represented in terms of their non-normative sexuality. In an attempt to reclaim Bartman's gaze, Cox and flushed the archetype of the hot and taut Venus. Does this reproduce a violence? How might we grapple with the irreparable trauma that experienced by Sarchi Bartman? Here, Nana Faustine is reenacting the auction block on New York City's Wall Street. Wall Street is both an African-American burial ground for the enslaved and the birthplace of global capitalism. I describe this as a necropolis because of the relationship between racial slavery and global capitalism. Faustine alludes to this through her title, From Her Body Spring Their Greatest Wealth. And this is part of a series in which she's, post, she's posing at various um, sites in New York City associated with the history of slavery. Wangechi Mutu is a contemporary Kenyan-American artist. Second Snake Spawn is an example of Mutu's work that pulls from National Geographic, the history of art, and pornography. At the center of the collage is a portrait of a white man deep in thought with a skull on his desk. The skull is a reoccurring theme in Western art, which symbolizes mortality. We see in this collage black flesh, animals, a weapon, a white man deep in thought. It represents the black body, sex, and violence as entangled with Western thought, the Enlightenment, ethnography, and violence. And I would, I would, summer, I would identify this as an Afro-surrealist work. And Afro-surrealism posits that beyond our visible world, there is another world that is striving to show itself. And as such, Afro-surrealism seeks to excavate that world through its art. And thinking about a world in our current moment that needs excavation, I find myself wonder, considering Wangechi Mutu's training as an anthropologist, and it's likely that her anthropological training informs her artistic process. She uses black feminist assembling methods as she pulls shocking and beautiful images from the world around her and refashions them into a finished product that is explosive and radical. And writing in the context of failed promises of neoliberal representation as liberation for black people, um, Aliyah Abdurrahman posits that black grotesquerie as an aesthetic mode by black, for a black expressive culture to grapple with our catastrophic present. So basically what this means is that I'm thinking beyond art history and thinking about how the civil rights, the, the Obama presidency, we've seen black people represented in many ways. We've seen photographs of black people protesting. We've seen pictures and videos of black people being killed in the streets. And all this representation hasn't necessarily led to liberation for black people. So I'm looking at abstract artists, Afrofuturists, Afro-surrealist artists, as those who are thinking of a new language of representation that doesn't necessarily conform to previous ways of um, black art and black photography. <coughs> so overall, I engage flesh and body as always already racialized and gendered constructions in Western world making in order to query the risks and possibilities of realism and abstraction in black women's contemporary art. While my work finds some utility in the binaries of flesh and body and realism and abstraction, I endeavor to encourage a critical space for slippages, entanglements, and contradictions. Thank you.
all, it's wonderful uh, to be here. Um, my name is Enrico Riley. Uh, before we get started, I just want to, uh, again, um, thank Jerry Ann for organizing this wonderful event, uh, and also um, for my fellow, fellow panelists who have given some uh, really wonderful, uh, lightning quick uh, presentations. Um, I love the fact that there's a, a diversity uh, of opinions and a diversity of tools that people are putting forward to try to uh, crack uh, this ever persistent uh, uh, nut um, that we are all uh, dealing with. The name of my talk is The Black Body uh, as Infinite Receptor. This is really an ongoing body of work with subcategories. A main focus of this project involves Judeo-Christian -Christi narratives, elements dealing with persecuted individuals, where strong correlations can be drawn to the lived experiences of black bodies today. The paintings and drawings I will show you are both acts of remembering named and unnamed individuals who have experienced racial violence, but also, as my friend John Lansdow has so eloquently said, the paintings act as weapons for remembering. All the paintings are oil on canvas, and all the drawings are wax crayon on paper. This image is titled, Untitled, colon, A Very Old Game Revisited. This is how the work originates. I make these drawings mostly at night, and they are unconscious and surreal. The work started maybe five years ago with a series of drawings that made me really reconsider my art practice. The drawings get made at night, and sometimes I make two or three or five, and it's always very interesting to wake up the next morning and to see what I've made. Images of hands, a dog's tail, horns blaring, gun barrels, fences. These are all tools to try to put together a kind of lexicon of images and symbols <coughs> that might get at this idea of persistent violence. Sometimes the aesthetic of the work moves into the grotesque, and sometimes it moves into the profane, and I embrace all of these ranges of expression. This is an image called Untitled, colon, False Confession. Many of the paintings have uh, the first part of the title being called Untitled, because I want the works uh, really just to speak on their own without uh, any kind of explanation. And in some ways, uh, there's an attempt to really speak in a vernacular kind of visual language uh, that can be read and can be uh, uh, taken in by a wide range of the population, uh, not just uh, experts in art or art history, uh, but also people who might not have a certain kind of expertise uh, in the practice. In this work I present, the black body is symbolic. And its experience is both symbolic and iconic. By nature of the identifying characteristic of dark skin, pigmentation, the black body is consistently seen as other in the modern Western so social apparatus. For me, in particular, looking at medieval and Baroque painting to make connections with Christian martyrdom and other depictions of violence in the Bible and in the historic and contemporary um, in the Bible and the historic and contemporary violence towards African Americans 
is a key, a key subject. There is no straight narrative time in the paintings. The paintings mix together historical, mix together historical references dealing with slavery, possibly the Middle Passage, symbolism of water, symbolism of boats, but also contemporary symbols, gun barrels, fences, etc. This image is called Untitled and Midnight Together We Can Do Anything. This was made in Rome in 2016 before the election of our current president and before the events that happened in Charlottesville. The idea that African Americans have historically been defined as subhuman and therefore open to acts of violence, mistreatment, and marginalization, in my opinion, has forced it into an object of infinite reception. One look at American media shows it can be acted upon or projected upon even by authorities in the most violent ways. It can be given superhuman strength, sexuality, or sensitivity. <coughs> Clearly then, creative parallels can be drawn with the Judeo-Christian narratives as expressed to the historical paintings that represent them. For example, the simple visual act of placing a halo around the head of a saint, a disciple, or Jesus symbolizes them conceptually as other. These same bodies are then depicted in these paintings as being persecuted for their otherness through acts of flagellation or crucifixion, <coughs> the headings or burnings, or superhuman through acts of communing with God and through earth and animal. Two thousand eighteen is not eighteen twenty five or nineteen twenty five, but the catalytic qualities of race and racism still very much vex us as a society, and in the right conditions can quickly accelerate and put a person of color at risk. My paintings want to be part of a practice and conversation about remembering this particular quality of being identifiable as other. The African American experience, I think, is symbolic for many other experiences. The female experience, gay, lesbian, LGBT experience, Many other experiences can be uh, can take on this this characteristic uh, of being infinitely receptive to projection. So even though my work is coming from a very specific uh, point of view, I think ultimately it wants to talk about the universal ideas of human subjugation and suffering. I'm going to finish by just going through a few more images. I think there's about 50 seconds left. This is called Untitled Midnight Hunting. This is called Untitled Resting. Untitled Procession. Untitled Remembrance of Things Present.
untitled witness. Untitled respect. This is untitled resist resistance. I think that's it, and I think I'm out of time. Thank you very much. so much. Uh, we have time for some questions. We got one right here. Thank you. I, I continue to feast on this, and I want to thank each of you for your presentation. I want to check particularly with, with uh, Brother Enrico, because I had some difficulty trying to track your terms and your concepts. And I want to get at one that I need help from you and possibly with some also from Sister Alexandra, and I must apologize. While you were presenting, I seemed to not be paying attention because I was on my phone. I was actually sending a message to her just it was about your presentation. <laughs> uh, but what I want to get at is, in your presentation, you use the following expressions. Person of color, the black body. The expression the black body has become pretty prominent in a lot of particularly academic and other discourse of late. And it is particularly worrisome to me. So I really need help understanding what's going on with this concept. And so let me just put it this way. For me, undertakers and medical examiners deal with bodies. So when I hear the expression, the black body, I think, for me, there's an ontological move or danger of dropping out the subjectivity, the humanity, the person, the personality of the referent. That it seems to be a reduction to sheer physicality, which has been part of a long process. And so I, I, I just, I need to be educated to an understanding well, that's not what's going on, but that's the deep worry that I have, that those terms drop out something that is really important. Thank you. I really appreciate uh, your comments uh, and your questions. And um, I do think that there is a um, troubling, there's a troubling territory that, um, that we have to traverse. Uh, I think for most of the people at the conference as acad uh, academics, uh, but also um, for a few of us as visual artists. Um, so first off, I must frame my presentation as, as being a visual artist and not an academic. Um, so um, the nuance and your, your relationship with uh, terminology and vocabulary uh, is going to be uh, slightly slightly different uh, than, uh, than my take. Uh, having said that, I think it is those exact conditions of seeing the African American um, uh, women, uh, LGBT community as subhuman. I think it, it is that condition that opens uh, the possibility uh, for horrendous acts, both violent uh, uh, with regards to economics, um, uh, with regards to uh, keeping these populations from having a full experience. I'm interested in compressing the gaze of a person 
in a position of dominance with the gaze of uh, the person that is being victimized. So I am making images that um, want to try to expose the kind of vision, the field of, of view, the kind of uh, uh, perception that would then allow these kinds of events to happen. It's truly uncomfortable. Um, by no means am I uh, uh, obviously trying to participate in uh, the dehumanization of African Americans. But I think it is something that you, that I am interested in pulling forward. I am interested in not cutting that away. Because I feel like it is in the cutting away uh, that we forget. Um, it is in the cutting away uh, of these difficult images um, of this kind of language um, that so uh, uh, efficiently affects us that um, that we risk the possibility of forgetting. So um, I completely agree. Uh, I think it's difficult and, it's, and it can be dangerous. And I'm very aware how people might read the paintings. I'm very aware how um, a quote unquote white supremacist could actually use my images, you know, uh, to perpetuate this idea. Um, but it's more important for me to expose the gaze. And that's, that's really. Uh, why I formatted these images in this way. It's also a tension that I have with my own work because using spillers, like conceptualization of the flesh, is really about like pure physicality and pure material. And I think that um, one thing that makes it, makes it um, a little bit better for me is that I'm thinking of starting with the body, but um, from the body lets us get into other conversations. So for example, like thinking of like embodied theorizing, it can start with the body, but then it could turn, the body could be dancing, and it could turn into pleasure and personality and get us at some of these other ways. So I think that I'm trying to, to think of like violence to the body, but also the body used as like a tool for like pleasure and joy and other ways of thinking of it, if that makes sense. I also think that, um, yeah, cause I mean, I think, Spillers using the flesh really is it does reduce us to just just material just pure just pure flesh just commodity, and I think that um, it's still an important an analytic because it makes us not it makes us not disembodied people it makes us like it, it gives you it gets you a root in the in the world like a material root but then that could lead to other things like I said like dance and pleasure and um, yeah if that answers your question but. Thank you for that comment. I think that's always a struggle, and I've been asking myself that question several times so far. Who's the audience? Who's being referred to? And so, if you don't mind, I want to mention existentialism as part of this and one of the tenets being what I think of myself is what I think you think of me. And it's always on time to mention W.E.B. Du Bois. It is a peculiar sensation, this double consciousness, this sense of always looking at oneself through the eyes of others, of measuring one's soul by the tape of a world that looks on in amused contempt and pity. One ever feels his two-ness, an American, a Negro, two souls, two thoughts, two unreconciled strivings, two warring ideals in one body whose dogged strength alone keeps it from being torn asunder. So this is the perfect forum for having to address or at least recognize the tension between looking at oneself from the outside and speaking of oneself from the inside. And um, as towards your point, I think that the, the rawness of that term is important in an age where 
there is a desire to not be blunt about you know what you're speaking about when it comes to some of the ideas of the black body. You had mentioned Michael Foucault in one of his in his one of his books um, called Prison and Punishment. He had mentioned the idea of the black body being a commi um, commodity in the prison industrial system. He predicted it ahead of time, the pr prison industrial complex ahead of time. And what he said was that the prisons weren't meant as a way to rehabilitate. It was meant to be efficient, not to be rehabilit um, a, a center for rehabilitation. And so that idea of that black body, the rawness of it, meant that there was a price on the head of that black body to be in a situation where you are, are a commodity. maybe for some of the others, uh, kind of about the redlining of, uh, of uh, black art and, and forms of representation. And, uh, and I think of the way that uh, Carrie James Marshall has kind of contested that in our history, but you know, a couple of Boston artists like John Wilson and Alan Rohan prayed about how you know, up against, they came up in their careers against a kind of redlining about what, what was going to be possible for them. And I don't know what your thoughts about that are today, and maybe Enrico, the others as well. Um, well, I think that in terms of um, today and how we can view um, the, the system of redlining is, and, and li like I say, I'm, I've, I've you know, worked with both you know, in high school and in college, you know, teaching diff people of you know, different socioeconomic backgrounds, and so I'm always about making it plain. Um, I don't have time to speak academic language most of the time. And so one of the things that was really um, interesting about the idea of redlining was the fact that in a lot of the systems that we had placed, and, and um, especially when it comes to like the 1930s and kind of like that intergenerational b a, um, ability to transfer wealth, a lot of people who I've spoken to, because I, I attended a conservative Christian college, and so I had to know how to speak to conservative Christians, right? And one of the things that they were always telling me is, you know, why is it that slavery ended 300 so years ago the Civil Rights Act was already passed, and y'all are still complaining about some of these issues. And, he, and the reason why he, um, this um, colleague of mine told me that it was because I was probably a member of the most radical group on that campus, the Black Student Christian Forum. Just, just on the basis that we were black, and we were supporting, like, we were against police brutality and stuff, we were just the radicals on the campus. We were automatically named that. And one of the things that um, was really interesting was a lot of people see racism in the explicit and not the implicit. So the nigger nigger, they see that, right? Or they see, you know, if, if someone, you just, they see a lynching that happened, you know, back in the 1920s, they understand that. But when you talk about institutions and the idea that institutions, even if a law is passed, can pass down from generation to generation, how even if the Civil Rights Act of 1964 can outline redlining, how still the benefits of redlining could pass down generation to generation, that's harder for people to understand in the abstract. So what I've had to do is frame my conversations in a way that they would understand. So I'll give you an example. The institution, you know, of like, for instance, the state police, that's an institution that, and we're talking about that in the context of police brutality. And so whenever, you know, a colleague of mine from, you know, Andrews University, which is the Christian college I went to. I love it, I love it to death, but you know, there is some people there that, you know. <laughs> but, um, but whenever someone told me and talked to me about, you know, shouldn't all lives matter, you know, what about black on black crime, you know, you know the, the typical refrains of um, some of the reactionary rights um, conversations around those terms of um, police brutality, I always immediately switch because I always have to code switch based on who I'm talking to. And what I tell them is, if you believe in the idea of limited government, and police are the agents of the state, you should want for the agents of the state to be responsible and have agency in their power and not abuse that power. Because you support that philosophy of limited government, you should not want the state to abuse their power. And so I always try to frame it in a way that is palatable to them in terms of what kind of like that small government I, I, ideal so that not because, you know, I want to pander to them, but so that 
the conversation can at least get started from that point of view. And I'm always having to recognize what point of view I'm speaking from. And so even when the system of redlining, that's why I say that it's really important to kind of like talk about some of those abstract natures in our political sphere, because a lot of times abstract ideas like what you're talking about redlining or even housing discrimination are hard for people to see explicitly. Hi, I would have very little reason to know anything about Orange, New Jersey, but I actually do, and that's because a wonderful group of young people <laughs> called Orange Inc. I don't know if you're familiar with them at all, but there's a, a wonderful organization in Orange, New Jersey, and these young people come up every year to New Hampshire, and they come to the World Fellowship, which is in southern, the, the, the southern mountain area of New Hampshire, and the World <laughs> Fellowship is a peace and justice camp and conference center that is open to everybody. It's multi-everything, and it's one of the rare places where people can come and enjoy the outdoors and, and be welcomed and, and the young people who come up from Orange, New Jersey have more energy and more enthusiasm and when, when there's a, anything going on, they participate and every, it's an incredible organization. So I just want to mention that and, and let people know that it's a very welcoming place and Orange, New Jersey is part of New Hampshire. <laughs> <laughs> yes, thank you. Uh, we have maybe time for two more questions. Can you hear me from this? Okay. Um, I'm Sarah Sherman. I'm a retired professor from UNH. Um, I've taught American literature. And I just have a question going back to uh, the question, the conversation that we just had heard about the black body. And um, one of the things that um, I found most useful in thinking about some of these questions was um, black theology and feminist theology which critiqued um, Western uh, Christian theology's binary, which separated body and spirit. And I found um, those theological critiques particularly useful in understanding um, similar um, dramatized critiques in the work of writers like Toni Morrison in particular, and Alice Walker in that, that wave of womanist writers um, who really went at the, this notion that you know separating body and spirit is not helpful and it's also one of the um, theoretical underpinnings or ideological underpinnings of racism. So I just wonder if anybody has any thoughts about that. I love theology so I have a thought on it. Um, so uh, one, of the, um, one of the interesting um, things about um, the campus that I went on to um, that I was a part of for undergrad is that there were a lot of people opposed to, to the idea of uh, bringing together the spirit and the body. And so liberation theology, for instance. Um, there was one side of the campus, of course, you know, probably the Black Student Christian Forum, that, you know, supported the idea of liberation theology, that, you know, even if you're here on earth, yes, there is a heaven, you know, there's a heaven that we want to get to, right? And that, that our justice will be in heaven, but at the same time, we have to fight for justice here on earth. And then the other side of the campus said, you will get your justice when you get to heaven. You don't need to deal with any social justice here on earth, right? And so we were always having to battle between that idea of the spirit and the body because some people wanted to separate it, that idea of the justice being in heaven and then just leaving here the way you know, the way you came. And so that idea of, you know, kind of like that spirit body dichotomy was very important in you know my own transformation, not just as you know someone who was interested in theology, but as an artist, because then I got to have a religious perspective on a lot of my work and kind of like see, and so I'm not going to get too like you know biblical, but kind of like see cause some of the social underpinnings of some of the um, policies that we speak about. You know whether it's housing discrimination. <coughs> you know, in relation to what would Jesus and the Bible think about some of these policies that benefit the rich versus benefit the poor. And I can't separate that because of what was in the Bible for me. And so when you're speaking about that issue of, you know, the body and the spirit, those were always intertwined for me. And I think that it was a very important part of, you know, my growth as an artist and my growth as someone who thought about some of these issues.
Hello, my name is Althea Anza. I'm a sophomore here at UNH. Like what Kurt said again, it kind of was interesting that you were from a conservative Christian college, but you were part of a African American group. And I kind of like the like like growing up I never really had a specific like ideology, like I knew I was black, but I grew up predominantly in like white um, white schools, white neighborhoods, and growing up as like an adult I really noticed like there's a lot of issues when it comes to liberal versus conservative, all the theology, black versus white, men versus women, um, Christians versus other religions, gay versus straight, and I have struggled with that as an African American woman and a Christian, so I was wondering how are we able to like be like to communicate with other people even For some issues, it's tougher than others um, because, like I was saying, uh, a lot of the older generation, because I grew up in a, a Caribbean household, and the whole LGBT issue was not something that we just talked about. Because my parents were Guyanese, they didn't, they just didn't play around with that. And when it came to like mental health, they just didn't play around with that. They said, you know, God will solve your mental health. That is the end of the story. So when I say they didn't play around with that, they just were they were like it was north and south for that. One of the biggest things um, that you can do in terms of bridging the gap is being involved. Um, one of the things that was really good about um, the, the church that I went to and I currently go to is that there is a very activist group of young people in the church and it balances out some of the older individuals. So when they don't want to speak about certain issues, we kind of force the issue. Um, they didn't want to speak about you no know, mental health, but we brought um, a nurse and um, a nurse practitioner to our church, as well as a mental health physician to our church to speak about the mental health issues. And I went, we went straight to the pastor, straight to the administration, and we forced the issue. And so, one of the things that, because I also teach at um, at my church, and one of the things I always tell them is that you need to be the change that you want in society, and it has to start from you. And so a lot of times what I do in terms of trying to bridge that gap is I'm always speaking to the older generation. I'm encouraging to go out to those programs, right? Because generally they're usually in the church, they're programs for the youth that talk about dating, you know, gay marriage, mental health, things like that. But I've always been involved in not just getting the younger people to, the, um, to these programs, but also the older generation. Because sometimes it's very tough for them to understand because they just grew up in a different time. I'm not gonna blame them for anything. It's just how they were brought up, right? And so in, t in terms of trying to bridge that gap, I think it's very, very important that it has to start from a place where the young people are organizing inside of that church. Even if you know they might face pushback, because we've faced pushback from some of the things that we've wanted to do in the church. But being able to organize inside of the church, I think, is very important. And also establishing relationships inside of the church. I've always considered it like um, this. The church, for me, was always a place for people who were broken to go to. And so I never felt that I had to be perfect in the church. And because I never felt that I had to have the need to be perfect, I don't fake anything. I don't fake here on this panel anything that I'm saying. I don't fake church. You know, I'm always real because I know that the church for me was a place for me being a broken individual to go to. And so once I took it as that, like I'm here because I want to hear the word as a broken individual, then I, ha I was able to gain that ability to be able to push the issues for th that I believed in. Unfortunately, it's lunchtime, and I know folks want to eat lunch, and we need to sort of make sure that the catering folks are uh, doing their job on a time demand. So. Uh, but our panel will be up here if you want to ask them questions individually. Thank you for the... <laughs>